Number seven ministries. Hello, welcome to Number 7 Ministries Christian Outreach. Today's sermon is called Dispositional Perception. And before I get into the message, I want to talk about a certain song. I believe it's called Call My Number. And I'm not even sure what the artist's name is or all the lyrics, but I looked at the beginning of the lyrics of the song, and it says in the beginning, I traded my soul for a wish. And the rest of the song is about, uh, I'll give you my number, call me maybe, something like that. The, but the point is this, is that what in the world does trading your soul for a wish have anything at all to do with giving someone your number and having them call you? It, it, there's no connection. It doesn't even go with the song. And maybe they forced it into the beat. But the point is this, is that the song appears to be targeted at young teenage women. And the devil certainly has an agenda. And it seems now that in order for most musicians or famous people to obtain their their position, they have to sell their soul or trade their soul for the things of the world. And so I just want to make us mindful of when we allow certain songs to get in our head or we find ourselves, we start singing them, check out what the lyrics are and check out the spirit of the song and where it came from. And sometimes the devil works so subtly and brainwashes uh, populations of people without them even becoming aware of it. And so to me, it's the biggest abomination that they would even add that phrase, I traded my soul for a wish and then go on to the rest of the song. It's almost like if you took that part out, the song wouldn't be so bad. But the devil just wants to put a little bit of sin in uh, so that he can trick people and deceive people. So I just want you to be aware, if you have children, be careful with the things that you let your children listen to and make sure you listen to the lyrics. And if you hear your, your children singing things or saying things, uh, there's demons attached to songs. There's demons attached, and there's a spirit that comes with a certain song. So, okay, enough about that. I want to go into the message, dispositional perception. If you don't know exactly what dispositional perception is and those words intimidate you, um, don't be intimidated. It's very simple. Dispositional uh, simply means uh, position. You could remove the dis part and just put positional. And so basically, what is your position in life? You, it could be physical. It could be spiritual. It could be circumstantial. It could be financial. Your disposition. And then the word perception just means the way that you interpret life, the way that you perceive life, the way that you perceive the Bible, the way that you perceive other people. So you take the two of them together. And then my question to you would be this. Do you believe disposition, dispositional perception? Perception is good or bad. I'm going to say that it's not necessarily evil, but I'm leaning towards it's definitely not uh, always good to have dispositional perception. The reason being is that our cir circumstances, our situations are subject to change at the drop of a dime. So if we perceive based on our temporal situation, then the way we perceive is constantly changing and we could be like schizophrenic. You know, if our the way that we believe is based on us being on top of the mountain, then how are we going to believe when we become uh, in the bottom of the mountain? Then our, what we believe is not really stable. So God wants us to perceive not based on a temporal disposition, but God wants us to believe and perceive based on heavenly position, where we're going to be at in the future, not where we are temporal. Because some people uh, could be so prideful and arrogant based on everything's going good or some people can be completely utterly destroyed based on things are going bad but whether things are going good or bad uh, it's going to change eventually uh, it's going to flip you know God uh, raises up mounds and God humbles my question to you is this why is it that Jesus said if you go to the prisons you visited me if you give to the poor you've given to me if you go to the hospitals and visit the sick 
you've done it unto me. So my question is, it almost seems like does God or Jesus, does he love those that are in prison more than those that are not in prison? Does God love the, those that are sick more than those who are healthy? Does God love the poor more than the rich? Well, that's not true. God does not love one or the other more based on their circumstance in life. But God does realize this truth. And I want you to become aware of this truth so you could evaluate your own self. Are you viewing life based on your position rather than heavenly position? Are you believing based on your own personal circumstances rather than uh, heavenly circumstances? Are you perceiving life based from the flesh or from the spirit of God that's no respecter to position or flesh. I want you to evaluate your own life because God wants us to have the mind of Christ. So back to uh, perceiving or uh, how does Jesus love the those that are locked up more than those that are not. He doesn't but Jesus recognizes that most of the time human nature is often uh, liable to neglect the things of God when everything is going good. And human nature tends to cry out to God when their circumstances are not so admirable. When they find themselves in jail or they find themselves with cancer or they find themselves in despair, those are usually the times that the flesh cries out to God. And so then God says, well, because of that, I want the church to take advantage of those that are hurting. And when I say take advantage, I mean seize the moment, seize the opportunity. I don't mean use them or abuse them. I mean take advantage of an opportunity to give them love and give them Jesus and give them the word of God because that may be the only time that they're willing to receive the word of God. Um, you know, for me as a pastor, as a preacher, a teacher, minister, whatever, all that stuff. Uh, for me, there is nothing more enjoyable than to deliver the message and the word of God in hospitals and nursing homes and the funeral and in prison. And the reason why I say that because those are uh, situations where people are so hungry for the Word of God. And whether you know it or not, this message that I preach on YouTube is the exact message that goes on TV, and it's the exact message that I preach to those that are locked up in jail. And you would be surprised that the same message that people are condemning and judging and crit he misquoted that Bible verse. I don't agree with that logic. And people will nitpick and fault find and judge and just argue and fight. You know what? But you give that same message to someone who's in jail. They don't know what their future is. Their house has been taken from them. They can't see their kids. They don't know whether they're going to spend the rest of their life in prison, whether they're going home. They don't know. I could give that same message to someone with that type of position and... Boy, I'm telling you, they, they shout me down to the ground. If they had a tambourine, they would beat it. And they, amen, preach, preach, preach. Why? Did the message change? Or did the position in which we're hearing the message change? And so uh, with that being said, we have to judge ourselves. Do we, uh, when things are going good, do we get so critical when things are going good, do we get so judgmental? When things are going good, do we uh, have little patience in dealing with people? See, we all, and myself too, we all need to evaluate our life. And for my own self, I came from the gutter. I mean, the gutter gutter. I, I was looking at 45 years to double life in prison. I was going to kill myself. I hated Christians. I was an atheist. I saw no light at the end of the tunnel. And that's when I finally cried out to God. God was actually my last choice in life. I mean, I wanted to hang on to anything. And then I found out that anything that I hung on to failed me eventually. People failed me. I failed myself. 
money failed me, uh, women failed I mean, everything failed me, and then I chose God as my last choice. But we have to remember that after God delivers us from uh, hardship, after trials, don't forget where God has brought you from. It's a blessing to be a Christian because if you're a true born-again, saved, baptized by fire, if you're a true born-again Christian, it's a blessing because you have the old perception of the way that you used to think. You remember the way you used to think. And now God has opened up your eyes to give you a new perception, a new angle to look at life. And so you put the two of them together and it, it's, you become uh, more mature, more spiritual, and, and it's a blessing to have both. You know, there are a lot of people in this life that are not born again. They don't see eternal things. They only see temporal things. And we have to deal with them in that angle. Because if we try to give a temporal-minded person who's not born again spiritual eternal things, um, they're going to shut down. That's why Jesus used natural stories that had heavenly revelations because he was trying to make a connection. In Proverbs chapter 21, verse 2, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the heart. You know, in order for a person to commit a sin, they have to justify it um, in order to do it. They have to say, oh, well, I'm entitled to be able to get drunk because I have marital problems. Or I'm entitled to uh, cheat on my spouse because uh, I had a hard time at my job and I feel like I worked so hard I deserve this. You know, every person that does a sin, they justify it in order to feel comfortable in their sin. Otherwise, if they kept sinning and they didn't feel comfortable about it, then there would be no reason to sin anymore. People want to feel comfortable in their sin. They don't want to be convicted. They don't want to feel guilty. They don't want to be told that what they're doing is wrong. And, um, you know, what I found out uh, in prison is that the murderers think that they're better than the child molesters. The child molesters think they're better than the drug dealers. The drug dealers think they're better than the bank robbers. I mean, everyone thinks they're better than another person. Why? Because they did something, so they say, oh, I didn't do this stuff. And God's looking down at all of us and saying, you know, you all fall short from my glory. So you need to humble yourself, repent of your sins, stop making excuses, and get right. In John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So God is saying that we need to be born again in order to even understand what this Bible is talking about. Because we need the Holy Spirit to teach us what it's saying. Otherwise, we hear this and the devil and demons are blocking our perception from showing us the truth or breaking our concentration or bringing in distractions. So it takes the power of the Holy Ghost to even be able to see the kingdom of heaven. You know, there's a place out in Georgia called Stone Mountain, and you need a, um, what do you call them, a ski lift in order to take you up to the top of the stone. And it's a, when I say stone, <laughs> it's a mountain, it's huge. And when you get up to the top of this mountain, it literally oversees three states. You can look down on three states. And I want to tell you, when you get up there, your dispositional perception is totally different. I mean, people that are down on the ground, they look like little dots. Even if you have good vision, they look like tiny little dots. And when you get up there, you're able to see the bigger picture. When you're down on the ground, you just see right in front of you. You can't see all the things that are taking place all around you because of your disposition. Well, when we become born again, we are able to perceive the bigger picture behind everything temporal that's happening in our life. We look at things on an eternal perspective.